Yeah, well, when I started, I just started as a kid learning to play an instrument, you know, and um, as I grew in the music and within the music, I started to, you know, branch off doing my little writing and production, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Were early influences Jamaican uh, horn players or were you more into jazz and more American horn players? Well, the influence was definitely outside of Jamaica because the horn players were playing jazz also. And I mean, we have a, a like a fantastic set of saxophonists who really are great musicians, you know, Tommy McCook, Roland Alfonso, Sterling, Lester Sterling, um, and then you have a man called Guineer, Ariat, you know, all these people were like fantastic sax players. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and, and they, were, they were not even the people who really influenced me. I mean, outside of Tommy McCook, you, have, you also have this man called Cedric Brooks who influenced me a lot, me personally, you know. What, what, did you ever get a chance to interact with Tommy McCook on a direct basis? Very much. I have to give thanks and big him up because my first alto saxophone mouthpiece was given to me by Tommy McCook. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and it stayed with me for a very, very long time. I, I actually carved my sound from that. How was Tommy McCook? With your experience, how was he able to transition from the ska to rock steady to the roots of music? Well, he had it all, you know, as I said before, he was a fantastic musician. He was like just really, really great. And I mean, he, he's one of the best horn players I've ever heard, yeah. you know, and um, there was nothing he, could do, he couldn't do, you know. Mm -hmm. How did you break away from the pack of so many musicians in Jamaica at the time to kind of set your thing? Well, I think I, I, I was never afraid to step out, you know. That, I, that may have been my plus, you know. I mean, I may not have been as great as they were, but then I was never, there was no fear of me stepping out there and standing on my own, you know. I'm always, like, not afraid. <laughs> you had over the years being with the great artists did that help you in regards to orchestrating a live show performance because it seems like you are the orchestrator on the stage in regards to all aspects of the production from sound to well, what everybody's I, doing I, I, I learned that from a great musician called Sonny Bradshaw it's, it, he, that's a musician whom I grew up in his band yeah. I joined his band at age 15 and that's where all my that's where I, I, I got all my little things that... So he was the man that really gave you the grooming? Yes, because he, being someone from a jazz background and all of that, he was a trumpet player. Yeah. He, he was one of the first musicians that I came across who wanted to make a arrangement of every song. You know, he, he never just played a song from a, a, a normal arrangement. Yeah. He, he would create something, yeah. you know. He, he would try his endeavor best yeah. to create something different, yeah. to show a different side of the song. Yeah. And, you know, years of being in that band, you know, taught me that, you know, you can move things around and make it come different. Who were you guys working with in regards to artists when you were in that band during the time? <laughs> Most of them you, you would not know. Um, all of them were what you call the cabaret singers. <laughs> all right, then, top up. ten all singers, right, yeah, you yeah, understand yeah, yeah. me? So none of them were like... More go around do covers type vibe. Right. Yeah, yeah. My stint in Mr. Bradshaw's band, I learned like rapidly, a lot of things rapidly. Yeah. and. So, interacting with people like Tommy McCook and 
I mean, Glenda Costa, you know, because my teacher was very influential also. He was most influential to me, you know. He was also a saxophonist and played everything. So he knew everybody. And, you know, they spoke about me as the young... Oh, right. You understand me? So what happened was that um, I started to interact. I started to hang out with Dirty Harry, yeah. Tommy, another great musician, Marquis, you know, and great Bobby Ellis. These people are, you know, Vin Garden. Yeah. These people are great session people. Yeah. And what happened was that I started to interact and I started to learn. I sat in the studios every day and just listen and learn how they put all these things together and you know there were two other musicians who grew with me yeah. number robinson and chico chin so we formed a section the same man taught all of us all three of us to yeah. play and we so we formed a little section called ras brass <laughs> so at the time i was in sonny bradshaw seven band and number one Chica was in Light Park, so right. we the people band. So, you know, number said, you know, come over, let, we don't have no saxophone player. So I said, yeah, you know, because I, I really, I like my job, yes, but I want to do more than just play top 10 music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to create. So that's music. the first time now you got the, the, the freedom to create music. Yeah, so I went over to Lloyd's band. So at the time, we were doing Dennis Brown. me so we 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 became like the top band in Jamaica you know doing the backing for people you know culture Dennis Brown um, Trinity you name it How did you and then of course another great musician joined us a man called David Madden from Zappo yeah, yeah. of course you know David Madden and, and Glenda Costa did most of the Bob Marley stuff, you know, with Vin Garden and so forth. So he came along in a session with, so me, Chico, Nambo, and David, yeah. we were basically like the studio band of the late 80s to the 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How were you able to, to maintain the creativeness also? Because people don't know that you're a producer and a, a writer also, right? Yes, so well... The, just uh, for, for the time, though, because it seems like people have a, a wall they hit in their creative spirit. But it seems like, because it's just the norm to have Dean Frazier produce a song on every reggae album right yeah, now. Yeah, you know? well, well, I actually started to produce even before I became a real studio musician. As I said to you, I went in the studios every day. I sat there. I watched everything. And then, I mean, fortunately for me, I... I was able to learn a lot from E.T., Errol Thompson, who was the, the engineer for Joe Gibbs. Yeah. And then more fortunate for me, I met a man called Jeffrey Chung. Yeah. Jeffrey Chung played bass, guitar, all instruments, but he, he, to me, is one of the best producers ever outside of Jamaica. You know, he's deceased now, but he was like super great. and. I saw him do things with 16 track and 24 tracks that I've never seen to this day any other people do. You know, he was just magical, you understand me? And sitting there around him and watching him record and produce was just the greatest thing that ever happened to me personally. What, what I noticed when I talk to the, to the legends like yourself is that a lot of you have been exposed to other legends and other greats that, yeah. that led you on. But do you think the, the, the quality of the music now comes for the fact that a lot of the emerging artists aren't around certain elders to get that guidance? Sometimes some of them are willing to accept it. Yeah. But, you know, some 
you know, music is a funny thing, you know, some people like, well, this is my music and I want it to be this way, and yeah, yeah. you understand what I'm saying, and I mean, you can't fight that either, yeah. you understand me, I mean, he, this, this is a youth, he comes, he wants his music to sound a certain way, and there's no way you can fight that, he's creating his sound or his whatsoever he's creating, but, you know, I personally would love some of them to just, like, you know, merge a little and, 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 and get a little more experience, you know, in sound and, and what's happening, you know, yeah, it, yeah. It, it would work out better. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go produce for us some big, big hits that Dean Frazier. Well, yeah. Wild World, of course, you know, was produced by Sly and Robbie and Willie Lindo. Yeah. How I got involved in that Maxi Priest album was that Willie Lindo got sick halfway through the production of the album. And so he said that I must finish. So then that's where I got there and did the vocals, arrangements, and did all of that. And I've been there, I've worked with Morgan Heritage, Freddie McGregor, Sanchez, Taurus Riley, Dwayne Stevenson, Luciana, Sizzler. You know, I've gotten a chance to work, I mean, and produce. And what are, some, what are the, some of the uh, big songs that you put the pen to? I have written, I have co-write co, co with Taurus, of course. I yeah. co-write with Freddie McGregor. I co-write with Luciana. <laughs> yeah. Give praise to Rastafari. I, um, if you want to go with Freddie McGregor. We, I've, I've co-written co on most of the stuff. At what point in your career now did you consistently get that call? Like, when did it really pick up where people constantly call Dean Frazier to work on things? It, it has always been there, really, you know? And um, sometimes I don't wait for a call. I just go and create my <laughs> thing. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 really, I really and truly don't sit in a chair waiting for someone to call me. Yeah. I just, you know, for instance, like an album like Re We Remember Gregory, yeah. you know, Gregory has been a good friend of mine for years and you know he passed and I personally just said I'm gonna do a tribute album to him yeah, yeah. so I started the album and after maybe halfway through VP decided to come on board and yeah. you understand because the stuff was going well and all of that so you know I really don't sit down and wait for anyone to call me to say hey I want you to produce this I, I do my stuff all the time I've always rated most artists no. because I think that all of them contribute. You understand me? And um, the, so the music is never, is never like, it, do, it, it doesn't belong to any one artist. You understand what I'm saying? And I mean, I've always believed that. Seeing, for instance, I've always believed that Bob Marley is the magic. But then, Peter Tash has always been like my favorite. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And then, of course, I've, I've come across so many greats. Bonnie Whaler and um, Joe Higgs, you know, the Mighty Diamonds. These are people who have really giving me personally a why, lot why, of inspiration. Why do you think Joe Higgs don't get, get that acknowledgement and all that? It's like he's not, he don't get enough acknowledgement in the history of Joe Higgs from people. And he played a, a great role to the music and a great Well, well as, as I said before, right, yeah. if, if, if we had, if we had that kind of media that supported our, our, our great and, and, and our legends, you know, people like Joe Higgs would have really been on the lips of everybody. Yeah. Seen, but you know, I knew the work that he used to do, which I guess I'm following through with the same kind of work, and you know, so it's nothing new. He was always great. How did you manage? Because first of all, you have a, a longer career, longer than most of your peers, in the sense of the level you've yes. been performing. How did you? Because you're like a great talent scout too, in a sense, right? Right. How did you figure to run with Luciano, then run with Taurus Riley? That that whole scene was a was a scene that was that just happened to come together, yeah. you know. I mean, with Fatis and 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 um, Fatis called me in, and and I was like the musical director for the whole of that. Era. You know, it wasn't Lucian alone; it was also Sizzle yeah, yeah. and and um, 
that whole that whole vibe was was really just magic created out of nothing really yeah. i just came to the studios and started to work with the different musicians and singers and um it just happened if you check history a person will speak about Shakespeare, but they don't speak about the actor. Right. But in our times, they'll speak about the artist, but we don't talk about who's behind the artist. Right. And you played a vital role in the, the run Luciano had and also Taurus Riley. Right. But we want to talk about Luciano now, right? Right. How, did you, how were you guys able to make that, that magic during that time? Because you had a, a real good run with yeah, that I, crew. I, well, as I said before, you know, I came to the whole exterminator situation. I made myself available and I, I really worked with a very, very nice set of people, you yeah. know, Firehouse crew, you know, Lucia and himself. I mean, we really sat down and we rehearsed for a long time, yeah. near, I think about a year, yeah. and, and, and until we put the whole thing together. You know, it was, it was never an overnight thing. It was a very serious long road, you understand me, yeah. to, to, to what people saw later on, yeah. you know, so it, 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 it might seem like something successful just jump out yeah. at you, but it was never that. Your, um, I, you you tell for yourself because people identify they say reggae sunsplash when you did your solo that was like a boost to the career um I think internationally people were blown away you yeah. know I, I think I remember the next night I was there and before you go just give us the background how did you end up getting that time to do the solo at reggae sunsplash well, you know, um, Bob Marley had just died and um, I had played Redemption song on a concert and thing. And, you know, we were still weedy people at the time. Then I went to London and people just loved it. So we did it at Sunsplash. And um, I don't think I've silenced 20,000 people since that. <laughs> you understand me? Yeah. But that night, I think I silenced 20,000 people. You could drop a leaf and hear it. Yeah. You know, and it, it was just something that everybody spoke about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was, was one of those moments. One of those moments. Yeah, yeah.